Club. Our speaker today is Jack McGowan, Executive Director of SOLVE. His topic, Building Community Through Volunteer Action. This is a Blackberry. I'm supposed to tell you to turn off this and cell phones and other things so we don't embarrass each other during the program. Thank you. First, a few announcements. Join us next Friday when our speaker will be Ambassador Alan Holmer, and his topic will be entitled Strategic Economic Dialogue with China. You can also check your City Club Bulletin for some interesting activities. First, next Monday, join Mercy Corps CEO Neil Kenny Geyer at the inaugural Bright Lights City Design Discussion Series. This starts at the doors open at 5.30 at Jimmy Max Jazz Club in the Pearl District. The discussion starts at 6 and admission is free. Join the New Leaders Council for the next film chat uh, on Friday, February 15th, and it's a showing of a film, Ezra. Ezra is the story of a former child soldier attempting to find internal peace after the horrors he both witnessed and committed as a combatant in Sierra Leone's decade-long civil war. The event is at the Hollywood Theater at 7 o'clock, and it's free. And one of the best parts of that series is the discussion after the show, which will take place at Laurelwood Pizza Company. And there, that's when those attending share their perspectives and thoughts on the movie. If you're interested in the topic of the movie, you should also check out the City Club Bulletin for information on the Citizens Read Book Club. The book this month is A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Boy Soldier. And the discussion of that is Monday, February 25th at 7 o'clock at the City Club Commons. It's free and open to the public. We wouldn't be able to have these City Club programs without the support and generosity of our wonderful corporate sponsors, and please join me in thanking our sponsors this quarter, Edelman Public Relations and the law firm of McEwen Giswold LLP. <laughs> Volunteerism. Paul Revere earned his living as a silversmith, but what do we remember him for? Well, the answer is his volunteer work. It's been said that all activism is volunteering because it's done above and beyond earning a living. Vol volunteerism deals with what people really care passionately about. Remember, we don't get paid to rebel. All revolutions start with volunteers. Today, we're fortunate to have a speaker who's both a national expert on volunteerism and also helped start a revolution in Oregon. Jack McGowan is the executive director of SOLVE. SOLVE is a nonprofit organization formed in 1969 by Governor Tom McCall and a number of Oregon leaders. It brings together government agencies, businesses, and individuals, and its work enhances the livability of Oregon. SOLVE generates over 85,000 volunteer opportunities annually and provides resources to more than 250 Oregon communities. Jack McGowan, McGowan is a native New Yorker, and he went to work immediately upon graduation from high school on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And it's interesting to note that one of his co-workers was his childhood friend and neighbor, Dick Grasso, who ultimately went on to become the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Jack moved to Oregon in 1970 and covered local and international news for KGW. Although he was not in high definition at that time, you may also remember him as a co-host of PM Magazine. We don't have any film clips that we can embarrass him with, uh, unfortunately. Before he became the director of SOLVE, he also served as the assistant to Mayor Bud Clark. He and his wife Jan, who's the associate director of SOLVE, have seen it grow from a one-person operation to the largest volunteer nonprofit in the Northwest. 2007 marked the third consecutive year that SOLVE was designated in, and recognized in the Portland Business Journal's 10 Most Admired Companies Award. Jack's passion for excellence is very evident. Among his numerous 
awards are the Oregon Business Association's Statesman of the Year Award and the Portland First Citizen. In 2001, Jack, Jan, and their son Travis walked the entire 427 mile Oregon coastline in the Solve Oregon Legacy Walk. You as City Club members are committed to civic engagement, so it's important before Jack starts for us to ask three questions. First, what good models exist for dynamic partners, partnerships between government, nonprofits, and the private sector to address societal problems? Secondly, how has the volunteer landscape changed over the last two decades, and how is it going to change in the future? And finally, how are we preparing the future generation of leaders for active citizenship? Jack has announced his retirement from Solve, and they are recruiting for a successor. I um, took a look at the job description, and among the requirements are the ability to present ideas in a manner that motivates and excites people. The job also requires inspiring public speaking skills, and now, Jack, show us why you're going to be difficult to replace. <laughs> Don, thank you so much. I think I better quit while I'm ahead. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> I really do. I want to thank the City Club of Portland and its members for giving me the honor of addressing you today. Also to local cable access providers and to Oregon Public Broadcasting for their continued commitment to all of Oregon by broadcasting the City Club's luncheon series of presentations. With this partnership, in many instances, it really becomes the State Club of Oregon, not just the City Club of Portland, and for that I thank you. <clears throat> well, as Don said, since my wife Jans, who was Solve's Associate Director, and my announcement regarding our upcoming retirement from Solve on May 23rd, there have been those, those quiet 3 a.m. staring at the ceiling periods of introspection. One realization for me has been that for the past 18 years, that I have been the Executive Director of SOLVE and have tried to keep Governor Tom McCall's vision for the organization and for Oregon alive. I was lucky enough, and I've come to understand that this was never a job. I was lucky enough to find a way of living my passion and finding yet uncovered parts of myself that saw the sun as a result of SOLVE being the key. Folks, how fortunate can one be? I also found that according to some study somewhere, the typical lifespan for a nonprofit director to be associated with a particular organization was somewhere between five and seven years. Well, after 18 years, boy, did I skew those numbers. My wife, Jan, as Don said, is in the audience today, and I would like to publicly thank her for all of her work for Oregon, and mostly for putting up for, with me for all of these years. Jan, would you please stand? <laughs> Jan should be the one giving this address because I say this in all of my heart, it is truly Jan that should be acknowledged and Jan is the reason for solve success, not me. It's this remarkable woman. Having yet opened up another personal door, please permit me to ramble a bit and think back. It was 1970 when I first arrived in Oregon, fresh from being a city kid and then a young adult growing up and working in the cacophony of Manhattan even more so working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But I will never forget traveling down the Columbia River Gorge for the first time and seeing the transformation from arid ridge to verdant cliffs. I had never seen anything else like it in my life. And looking back and coming into this place not knowing a soul should have been a very troubling experience, but it wasn't. There was something about this place that was welcoming, that was comforting. Maybe part of this comfort stemmed from, for lack of a better term, a wonderful naivete that gave those who lived here a grounding. I soon found that from this grounding sprang a quiet pride that was so different from what I experienced in my life in New York City. In short, no one here said that it couldn't be done, so we just did it. From the beach bill, the bottle bill, land use planning, which brought national recognition 
to more regional statements about a can-do attitude, like light rail, regional governmental bodies, and various downtown plans in cities and towns from across Oregon. When you mixed all of these out-of-the-box ideas together, Oregon was looked at by many with a degree of envy as that, how do they do that place? Were there sometimes flaws in these ideas that needed tweaking? Of course. But it showed, and it still shows, that we're not afraid to try new things. I so hope that we never lose those beats we hear that come from marching to the tune of a different drummer or to our own state motto, she flies with her own wings, for they have served us and continue to serve us so well. To say that I love this place called Oregon is an understatement, for it not only is about this wonderful region that has given me the remarkable opportunity to grow and become whole and to give something back, it is equally Oregon as a whole. From our coast to the hidden valleys to the remote, rugged places, it's a place where one can be in solitude with one's own thoughts and regenerate. There is a current, a thread, which courses through us. It shapes our identity about who we are and what matters to us. We need to keep that line of communication open because if we take this land called Oregon for granted, we might lose it. And what a tragedy it would be. In those early days of my love affair with Oregon, there was another person who had great influence on my life, even though, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity of knowing him. But I saw him, day after day, proclaiming his unabashed love for his adopted state. He stood tall, six feet four, but even if he was just my size, he would have had the same positive impact on Oregon, just because of his undying love and conviction for his Oregon. That was Governor Tom McCall. Little did I know then that someday I would be leading his child, Solve, in a quest to hopefully assist in building a better Oregon. Now I presume that all of you know about the annual Great Oregon Beach Cleanups. How many of you know about that? My gosh, thanks so much. How much do I owe you? Well, those beach cleanups are coordinated by Solve, and, and many of you have seen those wonderful posters featuring the stunning photographs taken by Ray Atkinson's stepson, our good friend Rick Schaefer. Well, those posters are designed each year by another great supporter and friend, a great designer named Steve Sandstrom. And, and the reason I'm, why I'm relaying this to you is that years ago, Steve came up with a logo for the Oregon Department of Tourism. And unfortunately, it was never used. But, but permit me, it went like this. Now, you've got to visualize this. Now, all of you have seen the graphic of Meriwether Lewis and, uh, Meriwether Lewis and, and William Clark standing together and looking at something off in the distance. And Lewis, arm outstretched, is pointing. And Clark is looking at the same point in the horizon with an intense look. Now imagine that same graphic, only with one of those cartoon balloons showing dialogue that you see in the comic section of the newspaper. And in the superimposed balloon, coming out of Lewis's mouth, you see only one word. Wow. <laughs> well, Oregon was a land of wow then, and Oregon is the land of wow now. Oregon is a tapestry. To see it from afar, it is like a mosaic, a picture. But you have to look closely to truly gain an appreciation of the intricacies of this remarkable place. For many years now, I, along with my wife Jan and son Travis, have taken the road less traveled. We not only are seeing the new vibrancy that is occurring in North Mississippi and, and St. John's neighborhoods, but also exploring the natural beauty and walking the streets of Prairie City, talking with the folks in Plush, having breakfast in Junchura, and watching the sunrise from Steens Mountain. And along with my wife and son, as Don explained to you in 2001, hiking those 427 miles along the entire Oregon coast during what was called the Solve Oregon Legacy Walk. As we went, Along that coastal route, we were joined by over a thousand fellow Oregonians. We did this as a statement about the importance of solve and of sustaining the Oregon spirit. I've been exploring Oregon now for 38 years, and I can say truthfully, the Oregon that I see now is just as intriguing and fresh as it was the first day of my arrival. But as I said, our, yours, and my Oregon is fragile. Tom McCall knew it and told us so. 
We cannot take this place for granted, for if we do, we might lose it. And if we do, it won't be in a cataclysmic instant like a subduction zone earthquake. It will be insidious, almost invisible, almost. I believe that is starting to happen now. We are beginning to forget how we got here and we're listening too much to the naysayers. This is broken. Look how they could make such a mistake. Nothing works right. While in so many instances, the rest of the country looks on us with a certain degree of envy. I am not being a Pollyanna. Yes, we have challenges. We do make mistakes. But also, please look at the goodness with what, at which we have. Now it seems in all too many ways the politics of division have taken over what was once a shared feeling of respect and trust. I'm not just talking about red versus blue. I'm speaking about the society of Oregon and how this fabric has become frayed by the written and verbal jousting that permeates our daily lives, whether it comes from blogs or TV or radio. We need a counterpoint to all this static, and maybe that's why I have loved and believe in Solve so much. For I believe that Solve is one of those counterpoints to all the vitriol that impacts us daily. The simple act of giving us all of the opportunity to give something back and in doing so, helping create a shared sense of identity of, as Oregonians is something that I believe is desperately needed. I say this because in the past 18 years, I, like you, have seen firsthand what happens when people, because of whatever issue has divided them, stop communicating. The opposite of vision is division. But I believe that they can find a bridge through the simple yet profound experience of working together through volunteerism. According to our founders' vision, Oregon needed an organization that would be a catalyst in forming an alliance between the sectors of business, government, and most importantly, we the people, the citizens of Oregon. Any one or even two of these entities could not bring enough resources to address challenges that would come to bear on the state. But if you could somehow, somehow, with the right chemistry, rally all three, you would create a dynamic that could continue to enhance the quality of life of Oregon. McCall saw, saw, saw Solve was that glue and that could link the three together. I'd like to give you a very brief overview about Solve and where we are today, but also look at how volunteerism has changed in Oregon and some of the positive outcomes a strong citizen-led volunteer ethic can bring to us and future generations. Currently, Solve coordinates 12 separate programs that we feel are both reactive and proactive. Probably the most well-known, like I said, is our twice annual Great Oregon Beach Cleanup. Solve, along with our government partners, Oregon State Parks and Recreation Department and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Division, brought this idea to reality over 20 years ago. This statement about Oregon has now grown to become an international model replicated in over 100 countries throughout the world. Speaking about that, I've got, a, I've got a funny beach cleanup story. I want to digress for a minute. Another question, how many of you have taken part in the Great Oregon Beach Cleanup? Good, maybe 15, 20 percent. Jan and I, I think by the end of this spring beach cleanup, I think this will be our 39th or 40th beach cleanup that we've helped coordinate twice a year. One year, well, the beach cleanups are crazy. It's, it's, it's a maelstrom of humanity coming down in one particular time frame. On a good day, six to 8,000 people will come down to 42 sites along the entire coast, staffed by volunteers at every site. And it is just this massive amount of humanity coming in all at once, everybody geared, ready to go, give me the bag, give me the gloves, and let me get out there with my kids. So Jan and I are at Glen Eden Beach about 10 years ago. And Jan's bringing in the volunteers and signing them up on clipboards. And I see this bus pull up. And I go, oh, gosh, a whole bus load, just what we need. OK, so I run over to the bus with my clipboards and bags and, and gloves and ready to go. And the lead of the bus, the, the first person off, is, seems like the coordinator of this bus group. And I come running up to this woman and I said, hi, welcome for the beach cleanup. Here's your clipboard. Here are the bags. Here are the gloves. Sign in, everybody. How many? About 50 people. We need them all signed in. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. And she said, Merci. We are French tourists. We came to Oregon to look at the coast. What are you doing? 
And I kind of looked and I said, do your, does your group speak English? And she said, no, I am the, the translateur. So I explained to them what we were doing and all of these French people are looking at me very intently. And with that, they started to nod. They all grabbed a bag. They all got the bags and the, and the gloves. They go down to the beach. They clean up the beach along with all these wonderful other Oregonians, come back. This one Frenchman comes up, puts his arm around me, and he goes, now we go to clean up the coast of Normandy. Au revoir. <laughs> you know what's great? That's what it's about. Volunteerism is truly international. It's just the human spirit. Well, in addition to those beach cleanups, Salve continues to annually engage tens of thousands of other Oregonians in literally hundreds of communities statewide by initiating partnerships with businesses, large and small community groups, and other nonprofits, churches, schools, and just about anyone who has the desire to get involved. This manifests in activities such as illegal dump site cleanups, watershed restoration, invasive species removal, enhancement of both natural and urban areas, helping economically challenged communities regain a sense of pride and self-confidence, and many, many other ways in which to get citizens feeling that they are part of the Oregon spirit. About those illegal dump sites I mentioned, how is this for a statistic, everyone? In just the counties of Multnomah, Washington, and Clackamas, Sal volunteers working on only one Saturday each year on Earth Day weekend since 1990 have cleaned up a total in excess of 12 million pounds of illegally dumped debris from wetlands, streams, rivers, ravines, and roadsides. What kind of debris? Washers, dryers, car bodies, sofas, tires, bags of garbage, mattresses. Of those tires alone, just on tires, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington County illegally dumped over 45,000. Most of them picked up from those streams and ravines. Imagine if that debris, which has such a deleterious effect on wildlife and groundwater, was not cleaned. The government doesn't have the financial resources to mount such a challenge. It is left up to the people to take it upon themselves to take a stand for our livability. In a recently conducted study titled Solves Environmental, Social, and Economic Impact on the State of Oregon, conducted by the University of Michigan's acclaimed Ross School of Business. For every public dollar invested in Solve, the return on the investment was a huge $64.08. Imagine a 64.8 to 1 ratio. Thank you. Now extrapolate those numbers I gave you before an illegal dumping in Oregon, and you think about Oregon as a whole, and you begin to say why, why this kind of volunteerism is so desperately needed. Equally important is the never-ending battle with invasive species. Whether they are plant or marine species, they are an equal opportunity threat to all of Oregon. No part of this state is immune. Solve Oregon Public Broadcasting, the Nature Conservancy, OSU's Sea Grant Program, and governmental agencies have teamed up together to one, alert people to this challenge, and two, to ask for the help in banding together to identify and hopefully control their spread. You'll see more of this in an upcoming documentary to be aired on OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting, on April 22nd, Earth Day. All of this is the reactive side of SOLVE, reacting to the need for restoration. But equally important is the proactive side of the SOLVE equation. How do we instill an ethic of stewardship, empowerment, and civic involvement in the next generation of Oregonians. That's where SOLVE's K-12 service learning programs come into play. Remember the old three R's of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, talk to the tune of a hickory stick? I'm old, I remember that. SOLVE's education programs brings two more R's to that equation, respect and responsibility. Respect and connection to the environment and to each other and responsibility, both personal responsibility and responsibility to your community. But really, solve, in, in essence, volunteerism for that matter is more than just the activity it generates. In so many instances, it can become the portal, a gateway to the new way of one's view about themselves and the world around them. 
Society has changed since the days when volunteerism's poster child was the hospital candy striper. Now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not demeaning those who donate so much of their time on a regular basis to worthy callings which bring so much benefit to so many. I'm instead stating the reality of today's time-compressed society with two incomes, one parent, two parent, one, one income, no time clock, 24-7 ways in which our lives are impacted. We at Solve, like any other or many other nonprofit organizations who rely on volunteers to help carry out our missions, realize that we had to not only change our messaging, we equally had to change the way we thought about volunteerism in general. So became the episodic volunteer. The outcome hopefully would be the same positive, sometimes transformative experience, but how? That was the question. About 15 years ago, we spent a lot of time at Solve speaking with our volunteers, observing who was volunteering. How many times were they coming back to Solve projects? Were they bringing others? As they had children, were they including their new families? It was gut check time. We found that the internal need for people to have a sense of involvement was still strong. It was that they needed numerous options that they could pick and choose from to fit to their limited time frames. Not only time options, but options that would fit their desire to be involved while still fitting in to solve charge for service to Oregon by Governor McCall. It seems to have worked. Our volunteer engagements in geographical areas of service have never been higher. I've said enough about solve. I relayed to you before how I believe that volunteerism can be a gateway to a broader benefit than just the activity. It's something that I call societal shift. The act of volunteerism just could be the crossing from a person being a passive observer. I'm watching the community. I'm watching the school. I'm watching the neighborhood. That's the passive observer. That portal, that gateway can create that person from becoming the passive observer to the active participant. This is my community. That school is my school. The people down the street who are in trouble are my neighbors. This is my state. I have a stake in this. I have a vested interest and sensitivity that reflects in how I interact, how and where I give, how I vote, how I feel about myself and my world. The more connected people feel to each other and to their world around them, the more positive they feel about themselves, their neighbors, their community, their state, and their nation. It's not rocket science. It's just human nature. And why not give that internal cord some resonance? In my 18 years of working on hundreds of projects with literally the thousands of people I've met across Oregon, I've seen firsthand the magic that occurs when people come together. I spoke to you earlier about those illegal dump sites, but you know what? You meet the nicest people in the world in the bottom of an illegal dump site. You want to invite them over to dinner after they have showered and changed. <laughs> Over these years, I've come to understand that the idea of community doesn't just happen. It takes a process. And that process I believe, and I've come to believe in, and kind of formulated, the process is really seven steps. I'm going to use the beach cleanup as an analogy, what I talked to you a little bit before about, and even those wonderful French tourists. They banded together with 6,000 other Oregonians. Uh, were they Democrat? Were they uh, Republican? Were they urban? Were they rural? Were they fundamentalist Christian? Were they lesbian or gay? Were they CEO? Were they mailroom clerk? No, they were everyone. They were all of those people. It was 6,000 people that came together under a shared experience. And that first step of the seven steps of community building was established. The first step was association. 6,000 of them associated with those other folk. 6,000 created association. And from association, what did they do? They spoke to one another. Dialogue was formed, the second step. And from dialogue, what occurred after that? Familiarity. They became familiar with them. You're not as bad as I heard you were, right? And from familiarity, what occurs after that? a certain degree of trust. I'm beginning to trust your kind. 
and from trust to consensus. My God, we actually do agree on some things. And from consensus to a shared vision. We can believe in something together. We have that shared vision. And from vision to the most important element and the final step of those seven steps, action. Action, we should do it. Action, we can do it. Action, let's do it. This interaction is not about the beach cleanup solely. It's about all of us in Oregon. We have to bridge this unhealthy perception of urban versus rural, Portland versus the rest of Oregon. Folks, we are in this soup all together. And we have to find ways of taking step one of those seven steps. So if this idea of connectedness, societal shift, community can translate into people not just having a sense of place, but a pride of place, imagine what impact it would have in the future of our beloved Oregon. The latest figures from the experts predict that in the next 25 years, approximately one million more people will call themselves Oregonians in the northern part of the Willamette Valley. Equal growth will come to many other parts of Oregon, both east and west of the Cascades. Tom McCall's often misquoted remark about come visit but please don't stay has long passed and is not coming back no matter how some of us feel. From Kennewick man, Kennewick woman, and Kennewick kid, to the Oregon Trail, to today, Oregon has always stirred the imagination and this gentle lady has welcomed those who came. The only Oregonians who were taken kicking and screaming into Oregon were the ones who were born here. The rest of us, thank you. The rest of us came willingly, looking for a better life for ourselves and our families. So with our next generation growing before our eyes and the Oregon Trail still alive and well, judging from our population rate increases, what is the message we should send? How about this? Welcome to Oregon. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the beauty, raise a family. But with all of this comes a degree of personal responsibility. You are encouraged, expected, not to be a bystander, but to contribute. It's time for a roll up your sleeves Oregon motto and campaign. Every one of us has sleeves to roll up and ways to contribute. As for Solve, soon you'll be hearing about a new citizen-led way of contributing to the health of our beloved Oregon. One of its themes will be that for 364 days a year, we get to experience and enjoy the wonders of Oregon for free. One day a year, we are given the opportunity of giving something back for that gift. It will commence around the upcoming Solve Spring Beach cleanup in March, so stay tuned. We'll need all of your help in ensuring its success for a better Oregon. Also next year, we as Oregonians will come celebrate our 150th anniversary as a state. The Oregon sesquicentennial will give all of us an opportunity to come together and take a deep collective breath as we celebrate, reflect, and look around us at the beauty and of our fellow citizens. Citizen-led volunteerism will be one of the clarion calls. My fellow commissioners and staff who comprise the Oregon 150 Committee are hard at work on programs which will give all Oregonians this invitation to be a part of the celebration. Solve and its fellow nonprofit partners across all of Oregon help nurture yes people. Years ago, the term a yes person was really a degrading remark. I believe in yes. I believe in yes people. Yes, you can count on me. Yes, I can make a difference. Yes, I will be there. Yes, I'll join my fellow Oregonians. When Governor Tom McCall created Solve in 1969, he stood on the steps of the state capitol. And the media, and business, and government leaders, and citizens were in front of him. And he stood there, and he talked about his undying love for his adopted state. And he came up with one of the most beautiful sayings I think I've ever heard because it creates such imagery in one's heart and in one's mind. And you've heard this before, so bear with me. I'm going to say it again. Governor McCall said, heroes are not giant statues framed against a red sky. They are people who say, this is my community and it's my responsibility to make it better.
I deeply, deeply want to thank you for giving me the honor of speaking with you. In closing, I'd like to share with you this allegory. There are two seas in Palestine. One sea is fresh. Trees and bushes grow near it. Fish live in it. Children splash and play in it. The River Jordan flows into the sea with sparkling water from the hills. Every kind of life is richer because it is there. The same River Jordan flows south into another sea. Here, there are no fish, no green things, no children playing. Stale air hangs above its waters, and neither man nor beast will drink of it. What makes the difference between these neighbor seas? Not the River Jordan. It empties the same good water into both, nor is it the soil or the countryside. The difference is that the Sea of Galilee receives water but does not keep it. For every drop that flows in, another drop flows out. The giving and receiving go on in equal measure. The other sea hoards its income. Every drop it gets, it keeps. The Sea of Galilee lives and lives. The other sea gives nothing. It is called the Dead Sea. There are also two kinds of people in this world. Those Dead Sea people who give without giving back, who take without giving back, and the givers who remain fresh and vibrant by freely sharing of themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all be inhabitants of the Sea of Galilee. Thank you very much. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership, and please limit your questions to 30 seconds or less and end it with a question mark. Today's first question will be asked by our board host, Liz Riley. In addition to being on the City Club board, Liz is the membership committee chair of the City Club. She is a consultant with the Collins Group, which is a fundraising consulting firm. And talk about a service ethic, it's very appropriate that Liz is the board host today because upon graduation from Vassar College, uh, for two years she was a teacher and community development worker in the Peace Corps in Malawi. Liz, she's been a member of the City Club since 2006. Thank you. Solve has mobilized an incredible number of uh, volunteers to take part in those episodic volunteer opportunities to improve their communities. Cleaning a beach for a day has probably been many people's introduction to volunteerism. How do you think that organizations can capture this interest in volunteering and uh, evolve it for some people into longer term or higher level volunteering? It's a great question. There is a, a Chinese saying, the longest journey begins with one step. You don't wake up in the morning and say, doggone it, from today on, volunteerism is going to be a part of my life. I am changing my life, I'm changing the construct, I'm changing my view, and this is what I'm going to do. It is a wonderful, addictive drug, volunteerism. Because the more you do it, the more those wonderful endorphins keep kicking in in the old brain cells and you feel better about yourself. The big opportunity and the biggest challenge, I think, for today's nonprofits is not only to understand what are the messages that we bring to the population in general about giving back, making it as easy for them as possible that, they're, that, that they will come to an event once there, that they are treating with, we're treated with such a degree of deference that they walk away feeling empowered, satiated, ready to go again, thanked because we believe it's solved, that truly it is a sacred trust. When somebody comes to volunteer, they are not getting paid. They are doing this, some internal cord 
was struck. And they're coming with their church group, they're coming with their company, they're coming with their fellow citizens, they're bringing their, their neighbors, their kids, and you have to understand that this really can be a portal. And so the most important thing I think that, 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 that faces nonprofits in general who rely on volunteers is really this aspect of it is not just one experience. You have to look at every volunteer experience, not only for the day what it does, but really look at that as almost a marriage of a relationship building opportunity that is not only going to benefit your organization, but as they become more imbued with volunteerism, other organizations will equally be impacted in a positive way. The rising tide lifts all boats. Hello, um, Hi. I'm Tamara DeRitter. Um, I'm actually a new, old member. I re-upped last week. So I, um, I have a, um, a burning uh, desire to help uh, those people that are falling into homelessness. And um, whether I make it on the city council, which I'm running for city council for position number two or not, I still want to help create um, emergency outreach centers that can help people on the edge of homelessness. And I see it as an ecumenical problem, or you know, reaching people from across all boundaries of, of churches as well as institutions and neighborhoods. Um, the question becomes how to get people mobilized. And my church is very interested in it. I know others are interested in it, but the fact is the face of homelessness is the people next door to us in our neighborhoods, and people don't recognize that's happening. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like your advice on how best to approach that issue. There, it, you're really bringing up, one of the, I think, one of the, the greatest challenges in, in society today, and that is um, how, do we, how do we create a commonwealth? Now, I'm not talking about socialism. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the essence of commonwealth is that people care for one another, that we are opening up our hearts and our minds and saying it is not all just about me. And I think it's a very, very important issue that this country, not only the state, but this country really has to look at, whether it be health care, whether it be going to be the aging baby boom generation, of which I am proudly one, uh, what, what a number of different issues that are impacting us. And we have to not only look at the infrastructure of this country, but we also have to look at the social infrastructure of this country. Because a country that has a poor social infrastructure, no matter how wealthy the country is, is still basically failing and will fail in the future. No question about it. We are, I think, bordering on crisis burnout as a society. It is one thing after the other that society is being impacted with. And you get to that point where you just say, I don't know what to do and therefore I'm turning off. And that's the worst thing we can do. There used to be in schools, and schools still do this, the concept of community service. And, 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 and we at Salve have seen it numerous times where a young person will come to, come to the beach not really being engaged, kind of handing a brochure or a form and say, will you fill this out? I've got to do four hours of community service. My teacher's telling me to. And they're doing this, right? And there's no, there's no eye contact. There's not engage. It's like, I have to do this. And what we have to do is change that equation for youth. We've got to get the youth feeling that, number one, they're empowered. And number two, if you say it's expected of them, it's not going to work. It's got to come from them. They have to think it's their idea. And I think that's the real important piece. So with the service learning component that Solve is really shepherding and, and, and I would say championing in the, in the state right now, it is really giving empowerment to the students where the students are coming up with their ideas under prescribed pro plans, lesson plans, but it's the teacher and the students forming a nucleus, nucleus and, and, and the, the students are the ones that are really saying, this is what we can do. Once they see it, they celebrate it, and then they reflect upon it. And so what you're really starting to see, I think, is a turnaround in that dynamic of have to to want to. And that's what we're trying to do with Solve. Is that answering your question? Great, thank you. Hi. Hello, my name is Sharon Joy. Um, I wondered if 
well, I com believe in combining problems to find a solution. And so elephants need more exercise and they need more territory. I wondered if uh, they could pull up some of those invasive species and maybe they could eat them. Um, uh, and in Forest Park, <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think about combining species? Well, I, th I think it's important. You know, the invasive aspect is going to be really brought to the forefront, I think, during the documentary with OPB. And uh, there are wonderful nonprofits like the No Ivy League in Washington Park that is really trying to help. In, in, out of Bend, there is a remarkable woman that is putting something together each year called Let's Pull Together. Uh, you have the Wallawa Weed Warriors. You know, you have these remarkable local groups that are expanding across the state, that is their, their, their hot button, are the invasives. And more and more people are joining those at the local level. And what's so great about it is we need to transform that local experience into think globally, act locally. Think as an, think as an Oregonian, but do it locally. Clean the beach as an Oregonian. Clean the beach is still the, out, the outcome. And so that concept of thinking local, acting global, is really, really a great way to go, I think. Yes, my brother works for the World Health Organization, and he calls that glocal. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jim Zarin, City Club member. Uh, in listening to you talk about this, it struck me that uh, you and Solve and lots of people in this room who are involved in nonprofits uh, come together and to try to do things that are make the world better in a sort of nonprofit, non-governmental way. But I'd be interested in your thoughts about in a perfect world whether or not this would all be happening through our governments. I mean, if you think back to first principles, We'd have people, we somehow organize ourselves into governments and we do things that collectively we couldn't do individually. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about the role of government and whether citizens should be engaged through our governmental institutions and whether or not the fact that we have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, all of these things through nonprofits, in a sense, it reflects a failure of our governmental institutions or don't you see it like that? I don't think it's a failure of government. I think, I think especially in Oregon, where because of our, of, of our uh, strange uh, system of, of, of uh, bringing in monetary resources to government agencies, you know, we go this way, right, with the economy. There's nothing level. There's nothing stable. And so government, local, regional, state, uh, really have one hand tied behind their back. They don't know what the next budgetary cycle is going to bring, and they're kind of figuring it out as they go. Because of that, and because Oregon has grown so much, and because government, I believe, has become so much more complicated, nonprofits really have to take it upon themselves, and the citizens have to take it upon themselves. You cannot expect the government to do it all. Don't you'll be sorely disappointed. They won't be able to do it. And in fact, in many instances, government doesn't know how to do it. Government doesn't really understand volunteerism sometimes. Not, no fault of their own. We work with a government agency, and they look at us cross-eyed when we say volunteerism. It's not in the culture. It's, they're not wired that way. It's not their DNA. Their DNA is substrate and rebar and that kind of thing. They're engineers. God bless them but they're not volunteer leaders. So the concept is to get the government to partner with, 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 uh, with organizations, not just solve, numerous organizations in this state. The analogy that I'll give, and I don't mean to be bur you know, just putting on one, but do you expect the state of Oregon to marshal state resources and clean the coastline twice a year? Good luck. It's not gonna happen. So we, what we would have, we would have a filthy coastline that is hurting the marine environment, that is hurting economic development for small coastal counties, that diminishes the pride that Oregon has. So you get a little nonprofit like Solve and says something has to be done, and Solve marshals, and all of a sudden 6,000 people come out of the woodwork twice a year and clean up their beloved coast. And what does that teach them? 
It teaches them, not teaches them. It brings them to the aspect, the realization of personal responsibility. And the government breathes a sigh of relief. And because the more citizens are engaged, the more maybe they'll understand about government. I have seen it time and time again where people vote against a levy election for a school district. You get them to work with that local teacher and his or her fifth grade class on landscaping the school, and all of a sudden, their whole view of schools in general, or that school district in particular, is changed. And where they voted no, 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 now all of a sudden it is, you know, I can't vote against that. I've seen how hard that teacher works. Those kids are my kids. I've got to vote for that school levy election. This is not social engineering. Somebody accused me of that, and I railed against that. This is not social engineering. This is saying to people, you have responsibility. You're expected. You're welcomed. You're appreciated. You're, we plead with you to be part of making a better society. Joella Whirlin, club member. A number of years ago, Jack, uh, quite a number of us tried to persuade you to run for governor. And you said, not now. I'm just too excited by what I'm doing for Solve. There is an open seat now for a new uh, representative from Oregon. Uh, Darlene Hooley has announced her retirement. If not now, Jack, when are you going to get into politics? And if not now, why? You, you had to leave it with the question mark, didn't you? <laughs> Joella, you know, Joella and I go way, way back to the days of when, when Joella was on a TV station in town. Um, I've been asked you know, numerous times to, to run for public office, and uh, I've always blamed it on my wife, Jan. I've always said, Jan won't let me. And uh, now there are no more excuses because Jan and I are leaving Sal, but Jan still won't let me. Uh, and and I, I just, I feel quite ca candidly, uh, Joella, that I'm not sure if I'm wired that way. I am not sure if I'm wired for politics. I think I can do just as much uh, leading nonprofits or being a volunteer uh, or being a community leader than I can be running for elected office. So I, I, I graciously decline. <laughs> How's that, Jan? Okay? Good. Okay. <laughs> Everything from marital, marital bliss, you know that. Okay. I'm Paul Schmidt, a City Club member. I've done about a half dozen Solve projects over the years, but I've also been personally impacted by what Solve has done. One way is that every time I walk along the Oregon coast, which is probably a dozen times a year, I carry a large trash bag with me. And invariably, it gets filled up, and I've got other things that won't fit in the trash bag in my arms by the time I get back to wherever I'm staying. Um, and so I feel like exponentially, when we do, when we have personal habit changes that are affected by the type of volunteerism that and the projects that that Solve does, that we're we're increasing the the effect on the state. Can you give me an example of two or three other? personal things which we can do, habit changes which we can make, which will exponentially increase the impact of the cleanup that Solve does. Oh, thank you. Uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to answer that, that thoughtful question. I thank you for that. I think it has to come from us. We have to, if we believe that this kind of volunteerism, volunteerism in general, if we believe that that is a needed, important part of society, then every single one of us has to bang that drum. I'm not talking south sackcloth and ashes here. I'm talking about how can you impact your own community? How can you get your neighbors to be involved? When you go home and you talk to your family members tonight, how do you express to them not only your own desire, but how to get them to be more involved? Not just telling the nieces and nephews and, and grand, grandchildren and, and, and sons and daughters, you need to do that. Come with me and let's do it together. That to me is so important. Pick your passion. Solve might not, might not be right for everybody. That's fine. Everybody might not want to contribute to solve. That's fine. But be involved in something. Contribute to something. Put your head on the pillow at night and say, I did something good. In my own little way, I made my corner of the world 
and life in general a tiny, tiny bit better. Solve engages right now somewhere in the neighborhood of 85. We don't know our, our figures quite candidly. Our, we, we try to track them as much as we can, but we can't give you a firm figure. But can you imagine if all of a sudden, three years from now, if this was a challenge where Oregon said to one another, we want to be the volunteer capital of the United States? We want more people involved in nonprofit work as volunteers and volunteering on school boards, on volunteering on committees. What an amazing message that would bring to not only today's generation, but to our children. Because for once we said, you follow our lead. You follow our lead and we'll make it and give a better society to you. That's the kind of thing I think we need. Thank you. Paddy Tillett, City Club member, you've spoken eloquently about um, how volunteerism works and what the principles of it are. Of course, the way those principles are, are applied produce very different results. And I'm sure you keep an eye on other states around the country to see what they're up to. What particular successes have you seen that we, we might take notice of? Gosh, Patty. You know, I, to be honest with you, I'm not an expert in that, that, that uh, subject in regards to what other states are doing. All I can do is, is speak as an Oregonian and the need in this state to be involved, the need of, of school districts and, and mental health organizations and social and service organizations and education and, and uh, the environment and all of those things are so needful. So it's not a question of maybe, and I'm not trying to be egotistical saying, well, we Oregonians have all the answers. Here's an interesting thing. In the past two years, through the State Department and the World Affairs Council of Oregon, it seems like we've become the stop-off nonprofit for delegations from other countries coming to Oregon. And when they want to talk about civic and social engagement, when they want to find out about volunteerism, for some reason the State Department and, and, and uh, World Affairs Council have solved as the stop-off point. In the past couple of years, we've had a delegate, delegation from Ukraine with interpreters come to us. And they said, how can you create volunteerism in a former totalitarian state? We've had a delegation from Japan and China come. How can you create volunteerism in a homogeneous society where volunteerism has never, ever even been discussed, let alone embraced? And the most meaningful one happened about six months ago where we had a delegation from Baghdad. And it was Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. And the question around the table through the interpreters was, after the bloodlust is over and we're so sick and tired of killing one another, how can we create a better Iraq through the form of volunteerism. How do you answer those questions? And I think the way you answer them is, like I said before, it's the human condition. After the sickness is over and we get so tired as a species as tearing one another apart, the concept of association and working together, I think, is really the building block. I'm sorry, we're, we're at, a, sorry. at a time. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Thank you so much. Jack, we greatly appreciate it. I do want to take a little bit, uh, 30 seconds of editorial discretion, recognize the City Club member. Um, Sharon Padgett, who's sitting at this table, she's going to kill me, but uh, she's a longtime City Club member. She retired from her job as a legal administrator from the Baron Liebman Law Firm last week. Baron Liebman is also a very good sponsor of ours. And Sharon's been involved in research committees and attends most City Club uh, fr Friday form. She also always laughs at my joke, which is one reason I appreciate her. But Baron Liebman, as a retirement gift, gave her a lifetime membership to City Club. So Sharon, we're glad you're going to be attending. Thank you. Jack, again, thank you. Jan, uh, thank you for what you've done to Oregon. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do. And we're adjourned. Thank you.